He was considered the world's greatest pianist, by a man who was considered by almost everyone to be the world's greatest pianist. Yet he lived and worked and died in such obscurity that one of the only pictures we have of him is from the back. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Charles Valentin Alcon. Alcon was born in 1813, and to an extraordinary musical family, of which he was the most talented. He entered the Petit Conservatoire at the tender age of six, and was publicly performing on the violin just a year later. He graduated with honors by the age of 13, and entered the musical world as a pianist whose prodigious technique turned heads, and whose theoretical and compositional knowledge also likely knew no bounds, as his Opus 1 dates from the tender age of 14. He suffered an extreme version of stage fright, and so his public performances dwindled to rarities. Although if you asked his friends, he was by all accounts a warm and lively individual, and a circle of friends included such musical luminaries as Franz Liszt and Frédéric Chopin. In fact, he lived in the same apartment as Chopin for a while, just right down the hall from him, and it's likely that Chopin's young death took a toll on Alcan's psyche. In addition to his lack of public performances compared to his friends, Alcan wasn't a foreigner. He was actually from France, and foreigners attracted a lot of extra attention on themselves just from being, you know, exotic or something. Alcan's Jewish heritage also didn't really help him in this regard. But he didn't seem particularly adherent to his family's faith. In fact, he had grand visions of setting the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, to music. And he actually went about a completely new translation of the Bible from the original Hebrew into French since he was fluent in both languages. However, there are conflicting accounts of just how observant he was to his family's faith, further compounded by the fact that after his death they found a large number of Jewish publications in his library. He worked almost as exclusively for the piano as did Frédéric Chopin, although Alcan was also known to use a bizarre and nowadays practically defunct instrument known as the pedal piano. Basically this was a piano with a set of organ pedals hooked up to low bass strings, and he liked this because it got more of a sound, a grand organ-like sound out of a piano, as well as, well, he thought it was just a good way to properly performed the works of J.S. Bach on the piano, which is a subject that has caused quite a lot of controversy over the years. As a result, the good chunk of his music that is written for the pedal piano is basically unplayable unless you can manage to find one. His non-piano music, of which little is surviving, contains many strange pieces, such as a funeral march for a dead parrot for double reeds and voices. Among the non-piano works that have since been lost, include a symphony for full orchestra. Alcon dropped off the map for six years after a scandal where he fathered a son by one of his married students. While Alcon attempted to avoid the limelight much more than usual, which is saying a lot, his son went on to become one of the first champions of Alcon's music. Alcon was an extreme introvert at heart, and it only got worse as he got older, but he still had to take on students in order to pay the bills. He spent some time teaching at the Paris Conservatoire until his awkward personality and, arguably, anti-Semitism forced him out in favor of one of his pupils, and not even a good one of his pupils either. His shyness turned to depression, and eventually his depression turned into misanthropy. He went to the apartment above his and constructed a passageway between the two so he could avoid unwanted guests, and he drowned himself either in composition or theology in order to cure his mental ills. Strangely, when he was in his 60s, he burst back onto the concert scene with several transcendental performances. Franz Liszt had always considered Alcon to possess a greater technique than even he himself, which is great praise considering how self-aggrandizing Liszt could be, and this is corroborated through the accounts we have of people who witnessed these kinds of performances. However, it must be known that Liszt's fame was due in part to his flamboyance and his stage presence, categories in which Alcan was, as we have noted, severely lacking. According to legend, Alcan died by pulling a bookshelf down on himself, reaching for his copy of the Talmud, although some would say that a coat rack fell on him. Neither of these is true exactly, and well, he was trapped by falling furniture after he collapsed at the age of 74. Since his death, his music has always been promoted by a select few who find worth in his music or in its public performance. But nowadays, his music is just so difficult that oftentimes you have Akan specialists like Jack Gibbons, who've dedicated most, if not all, of their careers to performances of Akan. While Akan is still something of an unknown figure whose music has just only recently acquired champions, his influence can be felt on later composer pianists such as Debussy and Sorabji and even Rubinstein. His piano writing is just so immensely difficult, and it shows that he thought orchestrally for the piano, such as his 12 studies in the minor keys shows 
And included in that collection is a full concerto for solo piano and a piano symphony. Both pieces wherein the piano has to imitate sections and instruments of the symphony orchestra. And all told, the 12 pieces take over two hours to perform. I'm not sure anyone has ever actually played them all the way through. Just playing the concerto or the symphony, heck, just playing one movement of either of those is hard enough. On top of the outstanding difficulty of performances, they're just very hard to read. Akam was a stickler for never modulating to easier to read keys, and so oftentimes you have passages which are just full of double sharps or double flats, sometimes even triple sharps and triple flats. His smaller pieces contain some of the most unique and forward-thinking piano writing of his era, using weird harmonies and even tone clusters to achieve his effects. He often experimented with progressive tonality, which is beginning a piece in one key and ending it in another something which came to fruition eventually in Mahler's symphonic masterpieces. Alcan was a strange figure, and his music is still very polarizing. Some see it as difficulty for difficulty's sake, just extreme virtuosity where it is completely unnecessary, worse than even the most flamboyant compositions of Liszt. While others see him as someone whose music must be viewed through the lens of his immense talent, as a path forward to the music that he would never live to hear.